I'd like to welcome you here. And uh, this title, First Rate and Fashionable, actually comes from a newspaper ad for John Rose, who made furniture in Knoxville in uh, about 1825. So, uh, you know, most cabinet makers didn't sign their pieces. He did. He was very uh, egocentric. He signed like John Hancock. Uh, but most people in a small town, a small region, would know who the cabinet makers were, and you know, you wouldn't have to advertise that much. But anyway, let's see if I can get my remote to work. All right. <clears throat> I'm Mike Bell, curator of furniture at the Tennessee State Museum, and most of the furniture we'll view today is from our collection. It represents a broad spectrum from carpenter-made chests with simple construction, like on the left, to this uh, secretary made by John Rose, speaking of him. Pieces like this made in Tennessee were often mistaken for Pen uh, Pennsylvania pieces. They were shipped up north and sold uh, until we did enough research about these guys that, that we found out Philadelphia cabinet makers did come to Tennessee to make furniture. Some of the pieces will be over 200 years old, and uh, they're still pretty sturdy, so I wish I could find a car like that, but probably won't. We'll start off with a uh, painting by James Wagner, 1859. There's Tennessee State Capitol. Uh, steamboats come in about 1819. I should probably add, some people might take a dim view of people like me taking their treasures from the state and bringing them to the State Museum. Mildred Hahn grew up in East Tennessee. She wrote a book called The Hawks Done Gone, and I love what she says. In, eight, in 1940, she says, there's something restful about being fenced in by the hills up here at the end of the holler. They make me feel safe from the wind and everything in the world, everything except them antique hunters. There's no getting shut of them. They would come if they had to cross hell on a rotten log. So there's Mildred, you know, but I think if she saw the museum and how people come from all over the world to see these pieces uh, for free, I think she'd, she'd feel a little better about it. Here's Nashville, about 1853, that's the market. And I just kind of set the scene here. We have the salt print in our collection. And here's our cabinet maker. This is from the Book of Trades in England, uh, about 1807. Looks like he's making a shaving stand. Here's an up and down water powered sawmill that we had at Old Sturbridge Village. So the water wheel would get this blade going up and down and the cabinet maker would come get his local woods. In Tennessee, it would be oak uh, for chair making, uh, walnut, cherry. And oh gosh, here I am trying to look like Abraham, I think. That's at Old Sturbridge Village, just made a little country Queen Anne tea table. And the first thing you'd do as an apprentice is you'd learn how to thickness lumber, and that would be the, the hand plane you'd use. It has, uh, excuse me, okay. this curved blade takes a real heavy cut. So when you buy an antique, what you want to see, like on the back of this corner cupboard, those grooves that are going up and down, that's made from that hand plane. They wouldn't bother to finish, off, finish it off like the top of a piece or the front. And those other marks going the other way are from the up and down saw. And here's Joseph McBride. We were just talking about him earlier. We knew uh, a maker, a uh, cabinet maker here in Davidson County made Andrew Jackson's desk and bookcase. And he also made the John Donaldson desk, who was a co-founder of Nashville. Uh, I was photographing this piece at the museum and found a signature, Joseph McBride on a interior drawer. And I was so excited, I found who made Jackson's desk after all this mystery. And uh, of course, running around the museum, I found this signature, you know. And the secretary says, you don't get out much, do you? <laughs> so uh, there's Andrew Jackson's desk and bookcase. Unfortunately, the Donaldson piece hasn't been loved over the years. The, the bookcase is missing. There's drawers missing. But you can see the similarities there. Qu uh, fluted quarter columns is another thing. They're on both desks. These are OG bracket feet. It's kind of like buying a car in the 50s. You know, I'll have quarter columns fluted, this, and that would all add up to the price. So there's the Donaldson desk, and uh, the Jackson desk had the same thing. Another thing you want to look for pre-1790 uh, are wrought iron nails, like this one here, made one at a time by a blacksmith. So you can date pieces by the hardware. Cut nails come in about 1790. Uh, 
wood screws with pointed ends come in about 1850. I guess, oh, there it is. It just doesn't work up there. <laughs> Blacksmith at Sturbridge was making nails one day, and a fellow from New Jersey said, oh, come on, they don't, didn't have nails in 1790. And he shared with them that to the best of his knowledge, uh, Christ was not glued to the cross. <laughs> so that's a pretty good argument, you know. Here's a tall chest. Uh, gosh, it doesn't look the way the proportion is funny on the screen. Anyway, it's a tall chest from Greene County, about 1800, and that's walnut. Here's William Galbraith's desk. He made this uh, kind of neat and plain on the interior, almost like shaker. Uh, and then he's got French feet there, which uh, is sort of a new invention in the federal period. This would be, you know, well, this is a little bit later, 1814, 1815 but it replaces those OG bracket feet, which were carved. And there's really hard to find signature, William Galbraith, 1815. He just scratched it in the bottom of a drawer with a, with a knife. So these guys were pretty humble. And you have to look really hard to find signatures. John Quarles made this desk for Samuel McAdoo in Wilson County about 1810. And it's, for Middle Tennessee, has a lot of inlay. Samuel McAdoo, he, inlaid his initials on the fall board. He's got these scalloped and diamonds and these strange uprights. So it's kind of folky, but yet he's got a lot of talent with what he's doing. There's barber pole inlay. I thought this was maple burl, but it's actually Chittam wood, which grows up on the Cumberland uh, Plateau. And there's an inlaid fan on the apron. The interior is impressive with the serpentine front drawers. And little hidden drawers come out of the valences. He's got secret drawers behind the two short drawers on the, on the top of the desk. And uh, I guess you hide your gold or your lottery ticket in that back drawer. Oh my, look at that. That's Star Wars. I love these special effects. Anyway, William Patton made this desk and bookcase about 1815. And uh, just a great use of sapwood and heartwood. What he's done, this is curl uh, figured cherry, he's got figured walnut with a uh, compass star inlaid. And this is sapwood. This would be the outer wood of the log. A lot of times cabinet makers would stain that so it all looked, but what he's done, he's used the sapwood to look like drapery. So it's a clever use of wood grain there. I liked it so much I used that same compass star on my desk box here. There's a trailing vine and a flower inlay on the, on the chamfered corner of that desk. And in more expensive city work, you'd have dust boards in between your drawers to keep your garments a little cleaner. And uh, I love the secret drawers here. So you have a, oh, that's marvelous. <laughs> For 1790, this is Star Wars. This little spring, you just depress it and that whole case comes out and the back panel lifts up and then you have secret drawers behind the, the drawers in front. Here's a more plain desk. We just call this a schoolmate master's desk or a desk on frame, d nice double ball foot. And in interior, he's just got wood screws for drawer poles. I don't see a sign of anything else. So it's kind of a backcountry planer piece. There's a corner cupboard, should be a lot taller. It's just strange uh, dimension. I wonder if there's a way to affect that. Anyway, it's Wilson County, about 1800, walnut. And it has incised carving up there and carved rosettes. Here's a sugar chest. Who owns a sugar chest? Anybody here? You do? All right, all right. Uh, from Williamson County? I think it came from Rutherford County. Oh, okay. This is Murray County, and it's cherry. It's about 1810, and it uh, was painted and grained about 1900. Kind of looked like oak a little bit, so that was in fashion. So it's Got enough age on it, we just left that graining on it, but it's cherry underneath. And then inside you have compartments for white sugar, brown sugar, coffee beans. And sugar would be pretty expensive. It would be about a month's wages for a barrel of sugar, about $28. You'd use sugar nippers to cut off lumps of sugar, um, and uh, they'd be stored in that deep well. This is what I call rat gnaws. Wherever you have food, you're going to have critters trying to get into it. Here's a slab sideboard. Uh, a lot of folks call this a hunt board nowadays, but it's kind of a watered down sideboard for serving food and beverages in a dining room. 
<clears throat> it's got that nice scalloped apron and a dental molding. It's kind of unusual. That's Hawkins County, about nine, I'm sorry, 1810. James Hicks made this sideboard in 1815. And he, he might have been trained in uh, Philadelphia. He's got a nice sense of design. He's got this bowed section that mirrors the uh, arched splashboard, and the apron is arched as well. And that's curl cherry. And I love this. Very few people signed things back then. This was signed by the person who bought it. January 25th, 1815, bought this sideboard of Captain James Hicks. Price $129, so that's a lot of money. It's got a nice reeded edge on the top. Samuel Holding made this piece about 1820 in Fayetteville. Same thing, he's got a projecting brake front here that matches that steps uh, splashboard. And it's kind of a flame grain mahogany. The way they'd save money, this would be imported expensive mahogany, but the sides and top are solid cherry, which is local and cheaper than mahogany. This has a secretary drawer that pulls out. And he had an auction sale down in Fayetteville, 1830. And of course, sideboards is first on the list. Most of these forms we know. The Madison table, we're not sure. It's, it may be after Dolly Madison, just the way you have a Martha Washington chair nowadays. And again, they had to take the top off of this to fit it in the van. You can hardly see it on this, but it's Samuel S. Holding in pencil. You'd only see it when you take the top off. So they're pretty pretty shy about that. Here's a chest of drawers from Washington County, about 1815. Has this unusual inlaid columns on the corner post and the cut corner inlay. And the fan kind of threw me. Uh, he looked like he was doing fine and then went out to lunch and had too much rum. And it, but what it really is, it, it's a uh, sort of a crude restoration job, probably in the 1920s. So I redid it. I just have to tint some shellac to match up the color a little bit. Andrew Johnson's brother made this wedding gift for him, 1827, just a simple little end side table. And he carved in the back the date of the uh, wedding. 1827 really doesn't go, these are circular saw marks. And you don't really see circular saw marks in the South till about 1835. So that tells me the top was probably replaced, which is pretty common. They take a lot of abuse. John Earhart Rose, that's where we get our title, first rate and fashionable. He comes down from uh, Philadelphia. He's trained, born in 1767. Um, <laughs> I love the way he comes down here. He writes a mournful song to an unfaithful wife, and he shows up one last time to sing it, and he comes down the wagon road and is seen no more, according to their family history. His wagon breaks down in Abingdon about 1810, so the oral history is, and he settles, he's 49, and he marries 19-year-old Sally McLean, and he sets up a shop in Abington. About 1819, I don't know why, he, uh, maybe a better market, he moves down to Knoxville, and he's there for about 10 years making furniture. So he becomes a uh, Tennessee cabinet maker, one of the first songwriters to come into, the, into this uh, area. But I mean, here, it's like an urban cabinet maker just having fun. He's got three different styles of American furniture here. He's got Chippendale pilasters with ball and cloth feet from the 1770s, animal, peat, animal feet um, from the 1820s, from the classical period, and then the urn and swags from the federal period. So he's got all that going on. And then at, at the top, there's his signature made by John E. Rose from Pennsylvania. Uh, White Station, and he gives the date 1824. Again, they thought this piece was from Philadelphia, and they sent it up to sell it in Pennsylvania. And then I said, White Station is uh, General James White uh, settlement in Knoxville. So it was made in uh, 1824 in Knoxville. So he's got all this high style stuff going on, and then he does this kind of folky herringbone molding that you see on moldings, in, uh, um, fireplace moldings in East Tennessee. Where do they get ideas? This is a design book, The Practical House Carpenter from London, 1799. If you see this bracket, it matches exactly what he's carved in, in that bracket on the on piece of furniture. Sometimes carving's missing, so I'll, I'll try to match his carving and, and restore it to the way it would be. 
Here's the uh, secretary that we have at our museum. Both these pieces are in our, in our museum. And it's really kind of an advertising piece. He's, the top of this looks like a sideboard. He's got silver drawers and a splashboard. He's got a secretary drawer, like a desk. The form is like a Jackson press with a projecting drawer. So I think he kept this just to show people what he could do. Um, and I love this. Well, that's his trademark carving, basket of fruit with eagle heads. But he's got these full books, which are really drawers. This is the life of General Andrew Jackson. This is John E. Rose's works. <laughs> you know, the secretary being his work. So it's the only guy I've found that actually got his name on the front of a piece of furniture. And there's those drawers, and there's John E. Rose's works. And there's his ad, first rate and fashionable. And I would have to say his, his carving is first rate. That's his father, Daniel Rose, who was a clockmaker maker in Reading, friend of George Washington. There's a portrait in 1790. This guy wasn't shy either. He uh, made musical clocks, musical canes, had a rose garden in tribute to his name with a wrought iron fence with busts of himself at the corners. So he wasn't shy. Little pull down tambour on the interior. Look at the way he's carved the columns. They're feathers and acanthus leaves. And there's a signature, which is on the underside of the top, but made by John Earhart Rose, uh, East Tennessee, from East Tennessee, Knoxville, July 28th, 1833. That's what you want to find. Who made it, where they made it, when they made it. Very rare in furniture. Here's a sideboard John Rose made in Abington. And you see it's got that same signature carving of the, the basket of fruit. And you, you compare it to the secretary. Um, I haven't found this anywhere else in furniture. I've looked, you know, New England all over where uh, that particular motif the carved brackets are similar to the secretary. And he carves right to the floor. I mean, he'd rather carve than eat. Uh, and there's an urn on the splashboard. This is more typical of backcountry Tennessee furniture. Neat and plain, Jackson Press, 1820s. Um, it's got original glass poles. They start showing up uh, around 1815, glass poles. Uh, rat gnaws on the back. Those are very early tin plate repairs, so we left them on. Another uh, Jackson Press. This is from Sumner County. Cherry, about 1830s. And this one we've got recently. I've had to turn knobs for the cupboard doors and the drawers. This is uh, made for the Miles West family, 1830s. A nice Jackson Press. I like the double panels. And it's got an unusual rail down here that matches the turn posts, and that's from Carthage, Tennessee. Here's a uh, pillar and scroll secretary from Memphis, and signed Titus Woods uh, and Company. Now, they were commission merchants, so this piece might have been made locally, or it could have come down the river, Mississippi, uh, from Cincinnati or somewhere else. So you start getting into a lot of imported furniture with steamboats. And that really pinches the cabinet makers in Nashville. Here's John Goss in 1830 saying, encourage home manufacturers. You know, he's trying to get people to buy his things. Tall case clock in Nashville here. This descended in General Dahlgren, Dahlgren family. He was a Confederate general. And uh, fairly plain, you'd, you'd get your uh, clock dial and works uh, probably from up north. And then a, uh, actually this came from uh, Virgi uh, Wheeling, Virginia, I believe, and the uh, case was probably made in Nashville. Here's John Earhart Rose again. I've, I've ended up finding about 20 pieces of his furniture, and I did an article for Antiques Magazine with it. it that first piece, 1989, we had the desk and his signature. That's all we had, and I thought, I'll never find out anything else about this guy. Well, I found out enough to do an article for Antiques Magazine, and. Uh, and, the, and I, I keep getting phone calls. People tell me I have a rose piece. So it's pretty, pretty neat, the paper trail he left. The only guy that ever carved urns in the base of a clock, I found out, after talking to clock experts. And he's still using that fluted quarter column, uh, which is really 1770s, 80s. And this is a 1920, or 1820s clock. This was made for Thomas McCallie in uh, Knoxville, at McCallie School in Chattanooga is after him. 
And you can see the urn on his sideboard matches pretty close to that clock. That's another way you can attribute furniture. If you know this guy made this one, if you find the exact carvings, you can attribute other pieces to him. And there's that tall case clock with the urn. And this one's from New Bloomfield, uh, Pennsylvania, 1833. I think he's going back to see his unfaithful wife. I'm not sure. He might, he might have a family up there. He's going up and down the, the wagon road for a good part of the century. And there again, a great signature, 1833, John E. Rose. How about that clock face? Where did that come Now, this was a, a clock maker up in uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Guthrie was his name. And uh, again, you, you, he would go to a, and his father was a clock maker. So I think he had connections in Pennsylvania. There's probably going to be a lot uh, of other clock cases by Rose that we'll find. But it, it just fine work. He's got carved rosettes there and gilded finials and uh, very nice veneer work as well. Here's a, a desk on frame, sort of a hepa white leg there, about 1810. That's Middle Tennessee. And blanket chests go back to colonial days and right up through about 1850. And uh, they'd store just about anything in there. Uh, I, I've read a, a record of food being stored in one, gunpowder. And there was one fellow sleeping on one who was hit by lightning and killed in Virginia. So you never know what you're going to dig up. Very plain, uh, cherry blanket chest. Putnam County, about 1850. And he's just painted this decoration with these quarter fans. We, I think we saw some of those before that are inlaid. Almost looks like a Masonic uh, design, but, but not quite. So a very cheap way to... Uh, Make a piece, it's just nailed together. And there's an example of an inlaid quarter fan. Let's take a break. Uh, she's taking a break. I, you know, we have so many wonderful paintings, I like to sneak them in. This is in the Tennessee mountains down around Mount Eagle. It was painted about 1887 by uh, George, it's not Bellows. Uh, I, 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 his name escapes me. But I just love the determination on her face. She's not on Social Security. She's out there growing her own food. Probably doesn't have John Rose furniture in there, though. It's a very plain carpenter-made chest. Uh, and they've just ornamented it with notches from a chisel, the same way spinning wheels would have that notched edge. Very simple way to adorn something if you can't carve or, or inlay. Cannonball bed, probably made by a Windsor chair maker. Look at the headboard is just spindles with that little comb. And this is 1820s Lewisburg from the John Batty family. And this is in our quilt room at the museum. Here's a writing arm Windsor chair belonged to Gerald Troost, who was the first state geologist in Tennessee. And uh, just Arrowback Windsor. Here's a fellow making Windsor chairs, 1808, John Priest. He also advertises sign painting, coach painting. You know, gives you an idea they had to really be a jack of all trades to make a living. In the city, you could specialize and make chairs all the time, the Philadelphia or, or whatever, but if you're in a small town or a budding town like Nashville, that's what you did. There's a brace back Windsor from Jonesboro, 1820s, from the Beard family. Uh, wash stand from East Tennessee, 1820s. Makes you appreciate your shower. You'd have your wash basin uh, and uh, just do the sponge bath, pretty much. Samuel Simpson is an interesting fellow. He comes down around 1840 from Philadelphia, and he made this tool chest, very elaborate, and this would be his business card. You can see all the inlay he did. He'd just show that to people and he would get work. Well, about the time of the Civil War, he became quartermaster for the 30th Tennessee. And I'd like to just read a quote. You know, you don't think of woodworkers being philosophical or poetic, but I th his journal is filled with poems he wrote. Cabinet makers would make the coffins, you know, when soldiers would die. So when he, this would be July 2nd, 1864 in Atlanta, after burying a soldier, he writes in his journal, I took young Hollis's body over to Marietta and buried him in the soldier's graveyard upon the gentle slope of the Marietta Hills. He sleeps his long, long last sleep. Far from his home and his dear ones, we laid him down. His funeral dirge is the sound of cannon and the tramp of marching columns, but they shall wake thee no more. 
The soft breezes of evening lull nature to sleep around thy moldering frame. The tall chestnuts, the waving grass, and quiet stream keep watch around thy lonely resting place. Soldier, farewell, thy warfare is over. May you rise to join the invincible army of the immortal soldiers in heaven is my wish. His grave is marked 466. Not only did he write these things, he had a, a, a camp chest, and any time a soldier died, he would save the Bible or pictures or letters. And uh, according to uh, an article I read in uh, the Tennessee Woodman, he returned all these things after the war, you know, whether it was Union or Confederate. There was like over 100 personal objects that were returned to the family. So pretty, pretty interesting guy. John D. Miller worked in Franklin, made furniture. And uh, this is kind of transitional, about 1860. He's still hand dovetailing his drawers, but you're starting to get machine-made moldings, steam-powered factory things. He, again, he's a, an undertaker, and uh, eventually goes on to uh, probably sell pieces he doesn't make. That happens a lot to compete with factory-made furniture. Richard Pointer, anybody have a Pointer chair down in Franklin? You got one, all right. He was a very popular chair maker. This is 1860, made for the Meacham family. According to oral history, he had a horse that powered his lathe to turn chair parts. Now this one had a rough time. This is from the Carter House, Battle of Franklin. And it gives you an idea, if a mini, mini ball goes through a, a slat of a chair, it gives you an idea what it would do to a bone. So um, that's the most dramatic piece I have, I think, in this presentation. Here's a food safe or a pie safe, cherry, uh, made by John Wolfe out in Sullivan County, East Tennessee. That's about 1850. This is cherry, nicely made, probably sit in a dining room. In Middle Tennessee, they're a little cruder and painted and probably sit in the kitchen. Johnny Rose, this is the latest piece I've found. Uh, this is a house down, Meeting of the Waters down in Franklin. Anyway, he made this in uh, 1853 and signed it. And he's still, got, he's still doing this 20, 30 years later. He's still doing that basket of fruit. He dies in 1860, uh, age 93. He was sick for seven days with pneumonia. It's not a bad way to go, I guess. And that brings us up to the factory-made Victorian furniture. This is our Victorian parlor. Uh, medallion back sofas, balloon back chairs, marble top tables. You start getting more and more factory uh, made furniture driving out small cabinet makers. But you still have people, 1889, Lewis Buckner, a former slave, does this marvelous handwork on uh, Victorian furniture, kind of the tail end, what we call, uh, you know, the, uh, I, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> if, if furniture was music, this would be Mardi Gras. I've never seen, these are finials. They're kind of like carriage lamps with, with mirrors that would reflect candlelight or a kerosene lamp, whatever. But he's carved just about everything you can, you can carve. And I'll see if I can find some more close-ups. The footboard matches that, that headboard. The side rails carved to a fare thee well. He carves right down to the floor like John Rose. And uh, some of these shells and things are done so well, you, you could see them on Queen Anne or Chippendale furniture. But he combines it with a very crude, or not crude, but folky stamped designs. You'll see them snowflakes, diamonds, geometric patterns. And uh, there again, I, I just, I wish I had better images. I'm doing an article on him for Antiques Magazine. As he's a former slave, it'll come out in Black History Month in January, February next year. And there is the matching dresser. He's got the carriage lamp things going. And there's that wonderful carving again. Uh, we think these are pears. There was somebody from UT thought, oh, that's wild African eggplant. Uh, maybe, maybe not. He was a slave until he was nine. So he's probably more influenced. And this is Sevier County. He's near the Smoky Mountains. Probably influenced by a pear tree more than anything else. Behind the mirror is a hat cabinet. So that's kind of an unusual feature. And when I purchased this, it's been in the Henderson family ever since 1889 until we bought it. He still had his great-great-grandmother's hat in there and said, do you mind if I keep that hat? And I said, sure. Now, there's wheat carvings, bellflowers, corner fans. It just goes on and on. Um, and it almost looks like an owl to me. 
he would make these little, almost the way you'd stamp leather, he's stamping the furniture. And there's another example there. Arts and Crafts Furniture, Mission Oak. I was looking for years to find a Tennessean who would, oh, go ahead. Just a question back about Mr. Rose. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, did, he, did he make those for personal use or was he, a, was he selling his carpentry work? You mean this? You don't mean Lewis Buckner, you mean? African American. Yeah. Oh no, he was working for, uh, he, just like uh, Richard Pointer, who had bought his own freedom, was a former slave. He was very popular Buckner in Sevier County. And he, he uh, has a couple houses on the National Register of Historic Places that he built. And, and he did a lot of the same types of carvings on the exterior of the houses. So yeah, yeah, he was very popular. He lived with the Henderson family for over a year while he was making furniture for every room. The pieces we have and a couple others were pulled out when the house burned, and uh, so we're lucky to have them. All the other furniture burned up, so. But I did find a fellow down in Mur Murfreesboro in 1912, Clark Woodard made a bungalow, a craftsman bungalow, and made Mission Oak furniture for the whole, the whole house. So I was lucky to get a piece for the museum. That's a Morris chair. And uh, he was instrumental in send it, setting up the industrial arts program down there. But the first Tennessean I found who worked during that period making Mission Oak furniture. Somebody else worked by hand. This is Ogle. Uh, 1935, he made a bedroom suite for his daughter who was getting married. And all of the pieces have this geometric inlay, which we call parquetry. And it's a nice thought. He's got a, a scale with two loving cups, perfectly balanced. So they love each other equally. Right up until they bite into the wedding cake, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> all right, be it ever so humble. Uh, I've read in some design book, all furniture can be reduced to a platform or a box. Well, here's an orange crate made into a chair. The orange crate chair, we didn't know anybody who was poorer than we was. There was 16 of us children, we was sharecroppers, and they'd fight over who would sit in this chair. So, and, you know, if you're gonna show John Rose, you might as well show this too, is the way I feel. Um, before and after, this is 1820s, Arrowback Windsor from Greene County. <laughs> this is a pepperback Windsor made by Craig Nutt, who does vegetable furniture. <laughs> he is a bit of a nut, um, but he loves vegetables. He's always gardened, and he got the bright idea of making furniture to look like vegetables. Here's 1820s, this uh, little tea table. That's his tomato table. I call Craig once in a while, how you doing? Oh, I got, I'm making a dozen lettuce chairs, you know. It's like talking to a green grocer. It's, it's, he's, he's really, but he's got pieces in the Metropolitan and the Smithsonian. He's quite famous with it. Here's a tilt-top okra table. Uh, this, anybody heard of Charles Rennie McIntosh? Scottish designer, he would make these tall back chairs in the arts and crafts movement. Well, Wendy Moriyama, artist in residence in Smithville for the Appalachian Craft Center, made Mickey Macintosh. And uh, last I heard, one of these sold for like $10,000. So what I'm showing you is studio furniture. It's kind of like contemporary art, only done with furniture. This is uh, a desk made in Sevier County. And the only reason I'm showing you, notice the hepa white leg and this block form to support the top. This is probably as far out as we get at the museum. This is a desk made by Wendy Moriyama. And there's the hepa white legs that really date to the 1800. And there's this block form, and then it's a writing surface. So it's, it's about as jazzy as we have. To open the door, you push this turnstile. <laughs> and it's got purple plexiglass bottom. Not exactly what I'd want, but it's more like sculpture than functional furniture. Here's a piece I made at Old Sturbridge Village. This is out of pine. It's a Sheraton style. I copied a piece made about 1810. Uh, Jim Horn up in Jolton had a dream about a, sh a Sheraton chest exploding. So he made this 2006. So contemporary interpretation of an old style. And here's a Chippendale chair I made at Sturbridge. It's got a shell like the one I have here out of mahogany. Uh, Worth Squire down in Williamson County, he'd used the same form, but he's got all the trees in the back to pay homage to a tree he cut down to make this chair. Here is a cellaret. This is the cabinet shop we have at, at the museum. I, 
I've been looking all over for a, a, an antique cellarite. I can't find one, so if you, if you hear of one, let me know. Tennessee. But he did a great reproduction uh, from the Art in Tennessee Furniture book, about 1820s. This is a piece made by Alf Sharp, current cabinet maker down in Woodbury. Pemberton Oak was the biggest, uh, tallest, white, oldest white oak tree in Tennessee, and it was up in uh, uh, northeast, upper east Tennessee. And in the Battle of Kings Mountain, soldiers gathered under that tree. So we had this made so kids could sit down and view our little slideshow on the Battle of Kings Mountain. And they're sitting in wood that was there, so it's kind of neat. And there's a close-up of that tree that he carved. Wow, look at these special effects. Uh, Howdy Doody, anybody watch Howdy Doody growing up? I'm not that old, I don't think I saw. But these were made down in Lewisburg uh, at the Cathay Furniture Company. Um, so a little bit of Howdy Doody history right here. And then to kind of sum up, here's John Rose again. I'd like to read a quote you know, to give you an idea of what it would be like to find a piece of John Rose's furniture back in the day. Um, Frances Kemble, a famous British ac actress back then, she was traveling in the South. She stayed at an inn and wrote in her journal, January 1839, there was neither towel nor glass for one's teeth, nor hostess or chambermaid to appeal to. I ran through all the rooms on the floor of which the doors were open. But though in one I found a magnificent veneered chest of drawers, neither of the above articles was discoverable. Again, the savage passion for ornament as I looked at this piece of furniture, which might have adorned the most luxurious bedroom in New York, here in this wilderness, something that would have belonged to the wealthiest citizen of New York in a house now which seems just cut out of the trees. This addiction to ornament and neglect of comfort and convenience is a strong characteristic of Americans at present. It is the necessary result of a young civilization. And that concludes my talk today. Thank you. Thank you. Keeping all his paperwork, did he write who bought his pieces? You no, know, I think he was more interested in telling you I made this piece. Uh, the paper trail I found uh, on him really came out of the archives up in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I found a letter. That the, the reason I know so much about him is his father was pretty well known, a friend of Washington. So there was a lot of research there. But he was kind of chased out of, he moves back to, to uh, Pennsylvania in about 1829, and he's being chased by creditors. <laughs> and this is my theory, he's, he's making this elaborate furniture for very, you know, farmers of modest means, they can't afford all this carving. So I think because he's so artistic, he can't make a living down here. So he goes back, his father dies in 1829, he inherits a boatload of money. And then he's going up and down the wagon road, selling uh, furniture and maybe seeing his unfaithful wife, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, his sons grow up to be cabinet makers in Abingdon, Virginia. They're doing neat and plain, and they're in business the whole century. So I, I think that's the story I'm getting. Whereas James uh, Lewis Buckner, the, the former slave, he's popular right up until he dies. He, he carves and works until he gets arthritis and he can't work anymore. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm really glad to get him in Antiques Magazine just to give him a national audience of, you know, what was going on in Tennessee. Because a lot of dealers thought, oh, you know, wouldn't, something this fine wouldn't be made down here. And, but what they're really doing, they could get better prices for a Pennsylvania piece. So if they say it's Pennsylvania made, this is back in the 1960s. They, you know, nowadays I think it's going to make more money as a Tennessee piece. Because we're, uh, just watch the road show, you know. Any other questions? Yeah. Are there um, a lot of these furniture makers, were there schools or did they, uh, did they establish like? Well, they, they would do the, the apprenticeship system. When you were 14, you could be apprenticed to a blacksmith or a cabinet maker. And, and you would learn the trade very slowly um, until at age 21, you'd become a journeyman where you'd usually, you know, you'd, you'd have a legal agreement. And uh, he'd, probably give you a suit of clothes and a set of tools, and then you could journey from one town to another. 
And usually the master cabinet maker owned the business and owned the shop, so. Yeah. Current day, do you oil any of this furniture to keep it? Oh, oil it? Yeah. Well, in a museum, you don't want to do anything that's irreversible. So if it's, uh, if it's got a shellac or a varnish finish, we would just use a paste wax that could be removed with a mild solvent. So you, yeah, oil would soak into the wood and then you can't get it out. So, so that's why we stay away. Now what you do with your own at home is, is, is uh, your decision, but in a museum we want to get it back to the original state if we, if we can. So does anybody own a piece of shaker furniture? That's my, my latest hunt is for a piece of shaker furniture with a Tennessee history, you know, because I, I hate that I can only collect Tennessee. I, they did such great things. South Union isn't that far from the state line. So, so call me, let me know, and then I'll take out a loan to buy it. <laughs> they had a great, their big fundraiser of the year is the first Saturday in December. Uh -huh. They had an antiques and craft show, and it's a pretty good viable show. Uh huh. So I need to get up there. I've talked to Tommy, Saturday. Tommy Hines up there, and he's very friendly. And I, I said, anytime you can't afford a piece or you feel you have too much, maybe we can buy one. You know. Anybody else? Everybody vote. Good, good, all right. Thank you.